Good afternoon. My name is Fiona Cottam and I'm the principal at Heartland International School and I'm delighted to join you for our fifth panel discussion of this afternoon and of today and the first day of the schools and nursery show here in Dubai. I think we will all agree, those of us who are here, that it's great to be back together again in real life. But it's also uh, an excellent resource that we're putting together a panel, um, several panel discussions over the course of the two days that you as parents can access from home as well should you choose not to be here and not be able to join us. Um, if at any point during the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, you have any questions, please post them in the group and I'll be checking throughout to make sure that we try and answer your questions. I'm delighted today to be joined by um, two expert colleagues, both gentlemen whom I know incredibly well, and I'm delighted that they're here with me. Um, Simon O'Connor, who is the director of DERA International School, and Darren Gale, who is the head teacher of Horizon International School, both familiar faces and well known to many of us here in the city. The challenging topic and question for the gentlemen on the panel this afternoon, however, is value for money. How will I know that I'm getting value for money in my school choice, especially if and when COVID restrictions are still in place? Um, we know that the, the city has faced huge challenges and many parents have as well in terms of um, job losses and big decisions that people have had to make in terms of school fees. How, how do parents know, Simon, I'll begin with you, how do they know if they're getting best value for money in a school? It's a complex question, and I think it's something that has changed significantly. I mean, we all three of us have been in Dubai for, for a number of years. Um, and there's a variety of different elements, I think, checkpoints that parents can look, look at. Obviously, any parent in any school that they're going to wants to get that value for money, wants to get the very highest standard of education. And I think you need to look at the things that schools are spending that money on. Um, the first thing to look at and, and, and um, is to look at the, the governance of the school. Is it a for-profit school or a not-for-profit school? There is no question that that reality changes the nature of the school. And it's not to say that one is better or one is worse, but it's simply the financial context of the school. There are very many schools, um, some of the best schools in Dubai are for-profit schools, and that's fine. Similarly, some of the very, there are not-for-profit schools as well, but it does change the financial reality of the school. I think the second thing to look at is the context of, any business spends a significant proportion of its income on people that it employs. So the, the, the teaching staff that will be educating their children, um, where do they come from? That will have an impact on what the school is spending its money on. And the third thing, but I would place it in third in that order, is to look at the resources and the facilities that a school has. Now, the caveat I would put around that is that resources are not everything. You can see schools that have got every facility under the sun, but actually the education that is provided is not to the standard necessarily that's being reflected elsewhere, but it is a factor unquestionably. Okay, I mean, the interesting points, and we'll come back to some of those, because mm -hmm. particularly the, the question that parents invariably do have about and you see it on social media groups, the difference between profit and, and not for profit. And I think many of us who are for profit organizations are actually struggling to make ends meet, never mind make any profit at all. Um, and, and certainly I would I, I do feel strongly that many of the most of the for profit schools, particularly in Dubai, there's a real reinvestment, isn't there, in education? Absolutely. And 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 I was quite deliberate, and I'm very happy to re-emphasize it. It is not the case that one is good and one is yeah. bad. It simply alters the nature. Similarly, you have some schools that work in big groups and some schools that are standalone. Mm. I will take the, the example that I'm in. Dear International School is part of the Alpha Tame Education Foundation. It is a not-for-profit organization, and we have two schools. Does that make it... Good or bad, I would say neither, but it simply alters the financial reality of that school. You might have another school. I came from a large group that was for profit. I, again, it doesn't make it better or worse. It simply alters the financial reaction. So I think it's important to look at that and be aware of the context of the school. Same question, really, Darren. You know, value for money. How, yeah. how do parents know? And, and perhaps this is more a testament to sort of my style of leadership. Yeah. But that is an important point of looking at staffing and reinvesting and making sure you're getting the best. However, removal of value for money, for me, schools are such personal places. The education of people's children is so personal that you can't be everything to everyone. And that, you know, as I speak to my parents, value for money, take the finances out of it. You have chosen the school and that's your school of choice for a variety of reasons, whether it's staffing, whether it's curriculum, whether it's assessment, whether it's resourcing, whether it's the infamous KHDA ratings. 
But it's going back to, is the school doing what it says on the tin 80% of the time for 80% of the people? Because for the best will in the world, we cannot be everything to everyone. And so looking beyond that sort of financing that has become such high profile of education in this city and looking more holistically at value for money representing, is the school doing what it says on the tin for the vast majority of people, the vast majority of time, is something that I would also encourage equal to looking at resourcing both human and non-human. Well, let's drill down to the crux of the question because it was actually related to, to COVID restrictions. Okay. Um, you know, certainly at Heartland, we've been fortunate that all of the children have been in all of the time. Mm. Um, some schools have had greater challenges than that, simply because yes. of, you know, there are larger schools, um, mm -hmm. the positioning of the school. Even moving that from one side, we're having to teach in different ways, mm -hmm. where children can't access some of the things that they've been able to access mm -hmm. before. How do parents know, particularly with COVID restrictions, that they are getting best value for money? Simon? Again, difficult because one of the things that actually helps you to understand that is an opportunity to visit the school and see around that. Now, some schools are, are taking the opportunity to allow parents on site after hours or at weekends and things like that. So again, it is a do, it's doing your research. Um, a, a lot of, and again, I would find out what the con reality is. I mean, interesting, you said that Heartland all students are on site. All schools now are required to offer an on site and an online yes. provision. Um, we're at about 85% on site, 15% distance learning. So again, I think it's worth asking a question, how is that provided if it is? Schools will have complex infrastructure in terms of their IT provision. Um, it could be that they're using a, a, a Microsoft Teams or something like that. But again, ask the question, um, how is that being provided? Similarly, I'm sure it's the case, on-site students will have access to facilities such as that as well. Um, so how is that being provided on a day-to-day -day basis? I don't think that these COVID protocols are going away anytime soon. I think we need to accept the reality that certainly for the beginning of next year, they're going to be in place. But it's asking that question, finding out what is the infrastructure, how are students being provided in terms of that? The second thing I would point out, which I think is very important, is that schools do so much more than simply delivering an academic curriculum. We, I mean, Darren has, has, has already mentioned this. I think the very best schools make sure that the well-being of the students and indeed parents and the, the whole community is being supported. So it's a very good question to ask what kind of pastoral system is in place, how are students being supported, um, especially in a distance context. One of the things I think that's being recognized is across the world in education at the moment is the mental and well-being impact of COVID on students. We have such a, you know, such a significant impact on young people at the moment, and I think we will be recognizing the impact of that for months and years to come. So what are schools doing in terms of that wider care, that wider pastoral care? Um, to support students as well, which I think is a, is a, is a crucial element as well. Okay. I'm not actually checking my emails, I promise, but I'm scrolling <laughs> through because um, our, our community are, are sending in questions in the background, which I'll come to in a second. But Darren, staying on the same topic and same question yeah. to you. I mean, really. it's, it's very, diffi very difficult, isn't it? Because the minute you are paying for a service, everybody wants what they want for that service. And, and Ev you know, parents want different things from a school and the school can only do so much within the context of which it, it operates. But again, I think it comes back to how do parents know they're getting value for money? Well, if, if the students are going into school and they're largely happy and it's about that ongoing dialogue and communication and students feeding back to parents about, yes, we're learning or parents can still see progress. Again, is the school doing what it sets out to do in its return policy or handbook. Again, getting value for money is, is about that ongoing dialogue and asking those questions because every school will say, I, I'm, I'm culpable of myself. We are trying our best. And, and, I, and I believe that of all schools in this city are trying their best and, and um, we can only do our best. But at the same time, if parents do feel that they, they, want to seek questions or clarity or feel that the school could do better or something is a remiss, it's whether that school is willing to listen and and to seek to understand really and, and either justify the rationale behind it or look to make shifts and adaptations where we can because we're, we're building the plane as we fly in this context. None of us have been trained for this, but we all come from the common premise of that we want our students to be safe, happy and achieve. Mm. 
Simon, something that you you picked up on there, and that was talking about mental health and well-being. And the mm -hmm. previous two panels, actually, that we've just had, have all have both been on those those topics. But you talked about how schools are having to evolve and change and grow. Um, talk to us about some of the things, perhaps, um, that DERA are doing in relation to maybe modif having to modify the curriculum to adjust to this new normal that we're in. As you said, it, it's unlikely that it will change for September. It may well do. Dr. Abdullah was very positive in the Magilus meeting we had the other week, where he did feel that things will change. Certainly will in the right direction. Yeah. Um, but it is likely that we'll have restrictions. How are schools like DERA uh, International and other schools indeed having to change and modify to demonstrate, not not because we want to demonstrate value for money, but because it's how schools grow and evolve and yeah. how we deliver. Well, I, I think there's two ways of looking at the, the circumstances we're in. You can look at it as a disaster, and certainly it's been very challenging. I prefer to look at it really, not removing the challenge aspect of it, I think it's acted as a real accelerant of what was already coming anyhow. Schools, I, I personally dismiss this kind of concept that schools haven't changed in 100 years. I think that's absolute nonsense. I think schools have changed significantly in the 25 years I've been involved in schools. But certainly the move to the use of technology and the move to use of artificial intelligence was coming. But I think we've moved and uh, had to move a hell of a lot faster in relation to that. So the use of digital technology, the use of online platform, the use of blended learning, the use of flipped learning, I think is something that two to three years ago, a lot of schools were essentially dipping their toe in the water on, whereas now is second nature. And it's really interesting to think about what will come in the future, because I think what is certain, and I, and I really hope is certain, is that we're not going to go back to 2019. There are so many lessons that we can harvest over the last 18 months really profitably. So looking at Deer International School, I mean, I'm very lucky. I started at Deer in September, which to, to starting to work with a school that was already quite a long way along this process. I think one of the things that characterizes the Alpha Tame Education Foundation is a commitment to this use of technology. So we were in a very good place when this came along. Um, but have accelerated that process. So the use of online technology, the use of so many of the apps and, and, and curriculum de delivery tools that are there. Now, there's a lot of them, and a lot of them are rubbish, but there are some good ones as well. Means that we now have a curriculum that is flipped in the sense that we expect students to have, have done it used to be the case that teachers would teach a lesson and homework would be provided. I think what we now say to students is this is the, the knowledge element that you need to, to actually learn in advance so that when you come to lessons, you are actually equipped to do so. We have online uh, assessment tools that are take a lot of the work away from the teachers. Um, we have uh, online reporting. I mean, one of the things that is, I would be very surprised if schools generally go back to um, a situation where face-to-face -face parent teaching is, mm -hmm. is the norm, uh, parent-teacher consultations. Um, I'm sure we will offer it as an option, but that, that convenience of communicating for parents will be something that uh, I think is here to stay. So it's accelerated that. And I, I am excited. Yes, it's been enormously challenging, and schools have been absolutely working to their max. But I'm excited to see what emerges from this as well, because I think, it will, I think not only will it be different, it has to be different. Mm -hmm. And it gives us, I suppose, a different premise of value for money, doesn't it? Absolutely. Because we're now adding value in a completely different way in schools that, that as you said, in 2019, we weren't doing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's worth pondering on, on all of those extra pieces that mm. we're now, we're taking for granted almost, that we're imbuing in our education systems as a result of COVID that we never did mm -hmm. before. Yeah, and I, th I just think it's the way that you know, a school has a set series of functions in terms of delivery of curriculum, delivery of uh, pastoral care, parent community engagement, etc. What we're doing now is doing it differently. And I think by definition, probably will emerge that we will be doing it better. better yeah. um, because otherwise we'd return to the yeah. old system. Um, but in terms of value for money, I think it is still, and Darren alluded to this, that the, the, the package in terms of what parents can expect from a school should still be there. And I think parents need to have confidence to challenge schools about ensuring that that entirety is still being delivered. Mm. But I think all of the community needs to expect that this will evolve mm. and will have evolved. Um, and like any evolution, we don't necessarily know what it's going to look yeah. like in, by the time that evolution is there. I mean, Simon touches on a, an important point there that I think it is really worth considering that parent, the, it's more of the anxiety of parents 
that we're, we're having to respond to because it's been 15, 20 years, 22 years since parents were in school. And as Simon said, schools have evolved and moved on since then. But have we, as an education institution, really taken parents on that journey of how schools have changed? So expecting to see a flick and tick in a, in a book and the traditional reports, the long, lengthy written reports and the, the constant homework, you know, being written down all of the time. I think that's where parents perhaps think that schools are not meeting the mark in, in the modern day because schools are very dynamic places and have evolved and have we brought our parents along with that, you know? Um, and, and just to follow on from, from Simon's point as well is that um, at Horizon International, we, we've taken the opportunity to strip things back and keep the main thing the main thing. Unfortunately, it was sort of death by initiatives and paperwork, and we were doing things because that's what we've always done. And the COVID pandemic has provided us with a catalyst and a conduit to, to strip away some of the things that are no longer having significant impact. You know, in the words of, of John Hattie, it's got to be a year's worth of work for a year's worth of progress. And some of the things we were doing, we were spending a huge amount of time, but there wasn't the equivalent impact on students' learning, achievement, or enjoyment. So how are you How are you making sure, Darren, that parents are reassured that whilst it's new and whilst mm. it's different and we're yeah. doing things in a different way, that actually they're getting, in some ways, getting more value for their money, believe it or not, because you're now being creative, innovative, more forward-thinking in terms of mm. your planning and your delivery. How are you communicating that to parents and demonstrating that? And, and that's a key driver for, for us all is that over communication. You know, we're constantly told that there's so much information coming out of the school, but it's using all of the social media channels and the parent communication tools that we have in school parent teacher consultations to, to give out those messages to parents consistently at the weekly, fortnightly, monthly newsletters, uh, student celebration events. One of the things, and just, just to flip it in terms of the context of today, we're at the schools and nursery show today, and as I said, you know, at the start, it's great that we are physically back together. The predominant group of parents who are here today are actually parents who are first time, mm. perhaps parents, parents who are looking for a school. And some of the previous panels have touched on, you know, choosing the right school, looking at curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of value for money, what are the questions? I know we talked about staffing, you talked about professional development, we talked about investment and in infrastructure perhaps, mm -hmm. and you did put quite rightly facilities, et cetera, as, as number three. But what are the questions for parents to ask downstairs or if they come along tomorrow? What do you think they should be asking the schools as they walk around to give them that confidence and reassurance that, in a in a you know an economic world that is a bit tighter for them that they are getting that value for money uh well i i, I would start with uh, I, i'm actually going to refer and use the questions that i've been asked today at the at the show so the first question is uh where did the let's take a step back you've already referred to this what is the curriculum of the school okay so if you've got a british curriculum or if you've got american curriculum cbse curriculum that it sets the context of the school in terms of value for money where do the teachers come from um, because I think that, as a set I've already alluded to, that's the most significant spend that a school will make. Um, I think the third thing is describe the facilities. An opportunity to visit is an important one. Also, to, to understand the context of the school in the wider corporate element. Is it part of a large school group? Is it part of a smaller school group? Is it a standalone? I would reiterate, because it's an important point, that's not to say one is bad or good, no. but um, it's... Uh, it, it sets the context of the school. I think another co uh, question is, is, is the school full or is it still expanding? So is it, for example, Dear International School, we've got just over 1,700 students, but we've got room for more. Um, looking at turnover of staff as well. Is this something, that, you know, we've, we've talked about the well-being of the parents and the students. Well-being of staff is very important. And generally, generally, it's happy staff will stay. So that's another question. Um, I think another question, an important reality for parents to understand at the moment is schools simply cannot deliver everything they want to at the moment. An absolutely vital part of a school is the enriched curriculum. Yep. So the opportunities that exist beyond the classroom, whether that's an after school club, whether that's trips, whether that's debating, whatever. And I think all schools can be really proud of what they deliver, but I think it's a great se uh, segregator as well, determining what the experience of the student will be. So when that comes back, what will the student experience be as well? Because uh, I think that tells a lot about the school and the values that it has too. Darren, I'm, gonna, I'm going to interject with a, a question that's come in from one of our parents who's watching from home. 
Um, and it's a question that um, we've all been dealing with for the, the last 14 months. And many schools have taken different approaches, whether that's through reduction of school fees or changes to structures and organizations. But the question is, the financial recovery will take a long time. Although it's not the school's problem, what can be done to lower the burden on families and what mm. actions are schools taking? Yeah. I think schools, irrelevant of whether it's for-profit or not-for-profits, yeah. it's philanthropic work. Many of the owners and shareholders want to make a difference and have yeah. an impact and that schools are hubs of communities, aren't they? And, and schools are fundamentally about people. And I think many schools across the city are taking steps to and are much more aware of the burden on families uh, in terms right the way down from school fees down to changes to uniform books you know all of those hidden costs to parents as well mm -hmm. and are, and are certainly from from the schools that i work with are very aware of the need of not to inflate that and and many of the schools of which in the network we can think about the bsme network are considering school fees freezing things you know keeping transportation costs at a minimum reviewing staffing structures to make sure that that is not always offloaded onto parents. Many of the schools have operated a pastoral um, parent support programs where parents can apply for discounts, you know, enhanced sibling discounts, and, and even schools looking at perhaps wanting to extend or renew playground facilities or update uh, fencing around the astroturfs. I think schools are much more aware to say, is this the right time to do this now? Because we, re we really realise the importance of having children in school, in classrooms. And if it means that some of the facilities have to stop for a while so that we can keep kids in class and children into class and coming to school so that parents can afford it, then I think most head teachers around the city are doing that. Yeah. Simon? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the beginning of when this started, I think many schools and many school groups looked to offer discounts because we were aware of the fact that parents had signed up for something that they couldn't necessarily afford. And I think I do think that the industry moved to support parents as best we could. I think it's absolutely vital now that schools are as candid and as transparent as they can be. So number one, what are the fee, what is the fee structure? And we can't speculate what it's going to be in the future, but I think we all understand that the you know, fees are controlled by the KHDA and likely to be fairly static in the upcoming. But similarly, it's a very reasonable question to say what elements of those fees can be offset. So that is, Darren said, number one, most school, schools will now offer payment plan provision. Mm. A lot of schools will offer sibling discounts. A lot of schools now have relationships with credit cards where you can spread that over the course of the year, but also at a discount. Um, similarly, there may well be refer a friend packages. Mm. I think it's unlikely if parents come in and say, you know, can I have a 25% discount? The reality is that, as you've also already alluded to, you know, even for profit schools, we are on a margin at the moment. Mm. So it's important simply to be as transparent and to be clear what the opportunities yeah. are. Um, and, and I think it's an opportunity today. I think it's, an, it's fair to say that the owners across the city, because we're not the owners, are we? You know, we're the principals. It, the book doesn't actually stop with us. Um, I think the owners across the city have not just been compassionate and considerate, regardless of school group and regardless of whether mm -hmm. it's for profit or not. I think they've been incredibly compassionate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that the cuts that have been made have been absolutely extraordinary to try and help yeah. families through this. But, but you're right, if we can spread the load in terms of payment plans, yep. um, in terms of reducing costs in any way that we can, I think at the moment we have an obligation to try and do that, but still keep the school running at the high standard that it should do so that yep. parents understand that what they are getting is their value for money. I think there is a perception that in any context, whether it's an independent, a standalone school or a large for-profit organisation, that you know that parents' fees are being taken and... and for the wealth of individuals that's not the no, case not schools anymore. are absolutely on the edge at the moment and many of them are making fairly heavy losses at the yeah. moment as well but but I, and that's fine and it's part of the relationship with the community but um it's not the case that this is a you know a massive revenue um earner for, for a certain selective billionaires and that just re-emphasizes the important point that Simon made there about schools being open and transparent and candid about the fees and, and the costs, as well as the point I made about that dialogue and communication that's really important. And can I just interrupt yeah, one course. really important point about this? That, and I think the three of us have been in this, been working in this context for a while. 
We're also, as principals, very much aware of the fact that parents' circumstances change. Mm -hmm. And we will all, I have no doubt, work with parents to try and support them. But the most important thing is that talk to us. Mm -hmm. um, because, yes, we are all working in fee-paying schools and we, ha we have to ask parents to pay those fees. If a parent comes to you and says, I've got a problem, what can you do? That yeah. is a very different conversation from, I've written 10 emails to you and you haven't responded. Yeah. Oh, well, this has happened. Always engage in that dialogue with the school because we know that parents value education often as the most important investment they will ever make and we will work to support, but we can't do that if we don't know. No, and, and we also do understand that it, it's very difficult, isn't it, to have yeah. to come forward to say, I'm in yes. financial yep. trouble because you're, you, we're suddenly having discussions mm. with parents about the privacy of their lives that they haven't perhaps had yeah. to share with us before. And that's very culturally yeah. sensitive yeah, to some is. demographic. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, um, you know, we've spent 25 minutes together. Um, the, the detail that you've both shared with us um, exemplifies not just both of your experience, but obviously your knowledge of the city. Final thoughts to share um, with our, our listeners at home today just on that concept of value for money and how we can work together with communities. Simon, final thoughts? I think two things. As a parent, especially, and we've alluded to the fact that many of the visitors to the school and nursery show are first time, um, and, and this is a new process, then do your research. Yeah. And don't, don't necessarily just take a website, go and talk to the school, and hopefully today we've equipped you with some questions that can be asked. But secondly, once you are part of that community, be a proactive member of that community and have those conversations because schools will welcome that. They want to talk to you. They want to you to be a parents to be engaged in the community um, and, and, and very much see it as part of an ongoing conversation that hopefully at the end of it will secure the outcomes and, and the, the, the education that both the parents and the school want for the children. Okay, thank you. Darren? I think um, transparency, authenticity is really, really important dialogue. Uh, and and also the good old fashions refer a friend. The word of mouth mm. is is so powerful in in this city because there are many gimmicks around. And as Simon alluded to as well, be, schools being candid and open and honest is really important. But also talk to other people, talk to the community um, to mm. find out what's what's about. I think we're all in agreement that the road to recovery is going to be a long one, um, yeah. not just for Dubai. Um, but for the world in question. But I just want to extend my thanks particularly to Darren and to Simon for their insights and their expertise this afternoon. Uh, remember that the show is running the rest of today through till five o'clock and all day tomorrow. Um, the queues are wonderful downstairs. We're loving the interaction. Um, it's great to have you here. If you can, pop along tomorrow. But in the meantime, on behalf of the Schools and Nursery Show, uh, thank you to Darren and Simon for joining me this afternoon. Thank you. Pleasure.